everyone. I'm Shaheen from The Content Mix, and I'm excited to be here with Gareth Fraser King, a veteran marketer, expert in information security and storage, and an author of several books on the topic. Thanks so much for joining us, Gareth. You're welcome. So can you just tell us a bit about your background and your areas of expertise? Yeah, sure. I've been, um, I've worked in IT for um, 33 years, 34 years, um, and I got into it quite by accident. And really, the last 20 years has, has been where um, I, I've actually had a, a trajectory that kind of makes sense, as opposed to, you know, popping in here and doing something and popping out again. And it's been focused on storage backup, um, information protection, really, uh, and security, so cybersecurity and all the aspects of information protection. Mm -hmm. And so kind of how did you get to get to that? How did you end up in that field? It was, I think, all these things. You know, I was in a lucky position originally. I My qualifications, all in the arts. Um, and so you think, so, well, how do you, how do you manage to go from that to, um, you know, my, I've majored in sculpture in my first degree. Um, so how do you get from that to IT? And I, and, you know, in 1987, it was, it was luck. Um, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And I got asked the question, and I kind of fell into it. And, and then, so about 20 years ago, I moved to a company called Veritas, which is um, now reinvented itself. Um, and that was all about storage and, and backup. And the, the game was to try and make storage, which is a, a little bit boring, um, a little bit more exciting. And um, I worked with some interesting characters back then, and, and uh, that's what we did. We made we made storage interesting, which um, in itself was an achievement. Mm -hmm. And how did you do that? And what mediums were you working in? So uh, in those days, it was much more traditional. I think one of the the mistakes that we make today is that we assume that um, the cheap option. Um, via email is the answer to everything and of course it isn't you still have to use the communications mix appropriately and, you, and you've got to push people in the in the direction of of the things you're instagramming or whatever you're doing um so it was much more straightforward in those days i'm sure i swear blind that we could profile uh, better 20 years ago than we can today um, and that's partially down to our ERP systems. It's partially down to um, GDPR uh, and you know, um, other uh, legislation, which kind of prevents us from doing that. Um, and, um, you know, so we would do live events. We would do PR. We did an awful lot of, of AR. I spent um, an awful lot of time hacking around Europe talking to analysts um, about what we did. Um, it was in the days where we had tech journos who would take stuff away and test it and see if they could break it. And, and then, you know, you have to have an answer for that and it has to be scalable. And it was, again, it was in the days where, you know, IT was really taking over from the business process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's something that is like touches all of our lives every single day, but it's like working in the background and... So how, I mean, but what was the answer to like, how did you make it interesting? What are the stories that are there to tell? Of, I think of it's data? about story. I, I do think it's about storytelling. And, and, and really that's how you gain, um, you gain interest. You know, the number of times that I look at, a, um, I get sent through something, I look at a website and I'm struggling to work out what the hell these people do because it's just written in that, that techno speak that is completely internally focused. I, I did an English degree, but I'm dyslexic, <clears throat> and I'm absolutely useless at acronyms. So every so often an acronym comes up, and I go, oh, I know what that means. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> or I just blank completely. But we use acronyms. We use our own languages. We we don't think about the, the target language. Um, you know, we, we, we don't tell stories. We, we just give people facts. We, um, we tend to overwrite things. And, you know, I'm, I'm fairly verbose as a, as a writer, um, but, you know, sometimes it needs to be short, sharp. And if you're going to, if you're going to grab someone's interest who wants to go on reading, you've got to capture them in a very, very short space of time. Um, and to do that is not, is in the best way, is not to sit back and go, oh, wow, because um, that's just, you know, not going to, to, to interest anybody. 
um, you, when you do public speaking, I've done an awful lot of that as well. When you do public speaking, the best thing is to take, you know, start off with either some like killer numbers or, um, or, or with a story. When I first started uh, writing a blog, which was about 2005, I think, um, the company I worked for at the time were horrified <laughs> that, that I would be doing this. Um, now we take it for granted. Um, but but it was kind of new at the time. But when I started out, I had, I don't know, half a dozen people reading it. And after about a year, there was about 300, I think. And then two years later, it was like 25,000. So it's a real slow burn. And and that's that's one of the things that you know, the industry, IT industry is not, is consistent. Um, the, the secret of business success is continuity, continuity of purpose. Which means that, you know, if you start doing something, you've got to keep doing it. It's no good. You know, if you're going to start a newsletter, it's no good doing a couple of them and hoping that that's going to suddenly drag in, you know, 50,000 clients. You might, it might become a big thing after four or five years, but, but, but not in that short space of time. And when things are on the stock market or in IT, where we've got this change going on all the time, it's very, very difficult to be consistent, but that's really what we should be aiming to do is so that people know, you know, the rule of marketing is that you you don't muck about with brand and you don't muck about with, with font color, fonts and colors and you know that kind of thing. Um and and you keep things stable. So um, you know, I'm talking to these guys about um how they're going to do that and how they're going to be consistent about um about going about that. Well, it reminds me of a quote. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but something about like business is creating order in a world of chaos. <laughs> and I like yes. that idea because it's kind of like being consistent so people know they can count on you. And I, that applies, of course, to your messaging and your marketing as well. But it's that, it's that um, whole idea of um, you know, who moved my cheese. Have you come across that statement? Sounds familiar, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't remember so the, what it means. <laughs> the idea is, and I, you know, um, if you if you live in a family uh, the size of mine, um, then the, it happens all the time. Is that you, you, know, you go to the, the the fridge fridge and look at it and go, ah, gone, because you know I've got children who hoover up anything that I may procure. Um, but yeah, who moved my cheese? It's like you you need. We automatically go in and we go Amazon.co.uk or, you know, ES or wherever it is. And that's just a, if someone took that URL away, we, we'd go, hang on, I was going there. You just broke it for me. I mean, what What's happened? You know, we wouldn't, have you gone out of business? So so I remember that happening where people had changed, changed brand names and assumptions would be made. Um, because it takes so long to get from vendor to end user that they just make assumptions that they if they've gone out of business or it stopped or it'd been end of life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Another question, changing the topic, but about you've um you know, the king of content, the ultimate piece of content you can create, I think, is, is a book and you've written a few of them. Did, did you do that in the capacity of in your past roles or was that something you did totally separate from your job? And what led you to write these books? Uh, so, so I had I, I'd written um, books that, um, that were internal books that, that were aimed specifically to, to fill a gap. Um, uh, there was the... Uh, early on, um, I'd been doing some training, technical training with the, some of the non-technical folks. So it would have been sales, marketing, HR, finance, legal, those kind of people. And somebody came up to me and said, you know, this stuff's all great, and um, but could you just tell me what that thing is again? And I realized that they needed a frame of reference because I'd been, you know, you you can train people by keeping it simple, but eventually there is this still this thing called a backup program, and you need a reference to that. So I thought this is going to be easy. So I went to the website and looked up whatever it was I was going to look up, and it had a pile of tech in there that that I struggled to understand. So I realised that you need we needed a you know a crystal clear 
And that was one of the first ones. So that was an internal book. It was um, around about 60,000 words. It was basically um, paragraphs on t- technology and product and saying what they did, what it did on the tin. It takes this thing from over here and it puts it over here. So if that thing doesn't work anymore, we can get this thing and put it back over here. Again. I mean, you know, like down to that kind of kind of level. Um, the, uh, when I started writing for Wiley, that was an accent. There was a, there was a friend of mine that I'd, I'd done some ghost writing for already. And he said, there's this guy who, um, is, I mean, he's technically brilliant. Um, but he speaks in consulting. That's impossible for anybody to understand except for another technical consultant. He said, could you, you, could you help him out and it turned out I, had, I pretty much had to rewrite it because it i understood what he was trying to say but you know and and he was so eager the way that he wrote so eager to get this stuff out actually there were moments where it was difficult to just untangle what it was that he was trying to say so i kind of i wrote about uh five there was 11 chapters i think i wrote about five of them but i had to rewrite most of it anyway um but that that was how it started so it was a joint thing um, that one was um, about data lifecycle management, and um, you know, and and my co-authors were brilliant, were brilliant. But I think that uh, I helped to bring it together. Yeah. And then I worked with um, Guy Bunker, um, who his latest gig was um, Clear Swift. And Guy and I um, wrote a, a one of the dummies guides. That was an interesting process. Um, and it was on data loss prevention, DLP. And it was actually before the company I was working for actually had a DLP product. Um, and I wrote that on my own laptop, flying backwards and forwards to the States, actually. Because if you ever looked at one of those books, you know, the black and yellow dummies guides. Yeah, yeah. They, they have 28 chapters. The last three or four chapters are, are just lists of things. You've got 20, whatever it is. Um, and then that's broken down into a certain set number of sections. And that the sections are broken down into another set of sections. And then those are broken down into three paragraphs. And then you've got to have one of those little icons. It's something like that. I can't remember. I missed it a while ago. And, um, and so when, once you, and Guy wrote the, um, wrote the table of contents, which was the most difficult bit. And all I did was I filled in the paragraph. So I, all I was doing was sitting on an airplane and and writing a, a paragraph about something and then writing a paragraph about something else. And I think I wrote most of it just going backwards and forwards from, from the UK to San Francisco. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, if I was going to give, give anybody advice about it, is 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 first used to be where, you know, author, technical authors or authors generally were, were sacrosanct. Uh, not so much anymore. People's span of, of attention is much smaller. I think printed books, um, from that perspective, that by the time you put the full stop at the end, um, it, it's out of date. You know, so that's one of the dangers of it. So anything that's dynamic is is good. Um, anything that's in sections is really good. Um, and, and I would have said, if you're going to go down that route, whatever it is, I mean, you, you know, get the table of content right or get the plan of what you're going to do right. Uh, and it makes it so much easier. How do you, th- yeah, how do you think the industry has evolved when it comes to technical writing? Because I think, um, like you said, maybe the book format isn't as popular as it used to be, but I imagine there's as much demand as ever for people who really understand the subject matter and can put it into simple terms. But maybe the the output in the, the people publishing that might have changed. I think I still think that the you know that whole thing of trying to capture somebody within a very short space of time is true. Um, I, I think that the the attitude towards technical publications, so user guides, um, has changed a little bit. It did feel at one point that the user guides were quite often written in Indonesian and translated by a Latvian into English. And, and I think that's changed. Um, I did, I did a, a, a talk um, to the Writers Guild of India a few years ago. One of my points was it, I like to hear people's voice. People quite often say to me they can always tell it's me writing because it's, it's got that. It's not that it's um, uh, a colloquial anyway. It's just it's the way that I, I voice things. 
And I think that's quite important uh, because it personalizes things a little bit more. Um, and I think in, in, in terms of our, uh, now my, my daughter does the same thing. She's, she's doing, um, social media for, um, some galleries. And her boss does not understand that it takes longer than five minutes to write something than the five minutes to read it. It's almost like people who, who, you know, an hour and 40 minute film takes an hour and 40 minutes to make, doesn't it? No. You know, you really do have to hone it. And in the, in, if you go back far enough, when we used to uh, proofread things, we'd sit opposite each other and you would go, you say, up is, uppercase V, and you'd read every piece of grammar, every piece of, um, you know, punctuation, um, and that's how you picked up uh, mistakes. We don't spend enough time, we don't give ourselves enough time to do that. Um, and I'm like, a, I, you know, I, I am very prolific, um, but quite often, because I am, um, I, you know, I model words up, I uh, put double words in. It really does need uh, someone to look over it because when I read it back, I, I read what I wanted to write. And uh, fortunately, my wife's a brilliant proofreader, so um, that helped. But, you know, that, that we don't spend enough time doing it. I remember the first time we didn't have a physical chromalin in front of us doing that proofreading thing. And we did it on the screen. And, we, and this particular company printed out 60,000 copies. Um, and what you couldn't pick up on the screen, which was slightly smaller than the ones we've got today, we couldn't pick up was the fact that it, it was letter size, not A4. Because you were looking at the whole screen and you weren't looking at, we would have picked that up Im immediately. You would have been able to see the difference. I mean, it, you know, it's it's a couple of centimeters, you know, it's a it's a one and a half centimeters one way and 17 centimeters the other, or whatever it is. You, you know, you would pick it up immediately. We don't. So we don't. I don't think we give ourselves enough time. We we try to do to do these things as a you know a straight off. And I think that there's no harm in leaning back and. Um, and asking someone for their help. I think the other thing that's important is that you're not precious about it. You know, it's content. And if somebody's got a different view, their, their view is just as, you know, as, as, as valid as anybody else's. Um, and that's because we're all consumers as well. We tend to forget that. You know, if someone has got a, a point of view, I mean, you, you know, it may well be that you don't, you know, you're aiming in a particular way and you're saying something in a particular way and you can have a discussion about that. But if someone turns around and says, well, I don't know why you said that because you did, did, did. I, I don't like it. Probably it's not, it's not constructive enough, but, you know, I think so. You know, collaboration, um, especially uh, between the, the US and, and Amir, I think is, is really important. And if you can't, if you can't pull that off and people get precious about things, uh, and not invented here, then that you know, creates a very difficult working environment. Uh, whatever you're doing, not yeah. just with marketing and content. Definitely. Well, so we're running out of time, but um, I, did you have any parting advice or for, um, I mean, those who are getting into the field these days, perhaps, who are getting into marketing and content creation? Yeah, I would, I would give, I'll give you a, an example, actually. I, um, when I was at university, I had to write a, a, a dissertation or two and I worked really really hard on the first one and I plagiarized like crazy and copied the language of other people and then hid it by using a thesaurus um, and and made it long-winded and when I when I re read it back I thought my god this guy's clever um, and I got a B and the second one I didn't have as much time and I just wrote it and I got an A plus. So believe in yourself more than you believe in the way that other people write because other people don't necessarily write correctly. I would have said, keep it simple and make sure that you look at it from an outsider's point of view, looking in and make sure that you tell people what it is, what it does, what benefit it's going to be. And that's not a feature, by the way, that's a benefit. So you can sit down and say to yourself, which means what? And that gives you the answer. Keep going as much as you can. So I have a telephone. Right? Okay, great. Which means what? Well, I can ring people. Which means what? Well, that means I can keep in contact with people. Which means what? 
I don't go insane sitting here. I talk to other people, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So do, you can do that. That's a good trick too. Keep it simple. Keep it very clear and very concise. And just don't go into a ramble and don't use buzzwords and don't use all the things because the, the, the CIOs and the CISOs and the techies and the management and the exec, you, you know, I, I mean, I was thinking very much about just approaching websites differently. We know what, what happens. We have home products, solutions, support, partners, about. I mean, how many companies don't do that? Yeah, One of the things I saw quite quite recently, it was it was by, you know, had and now the techie bit, but why not have home, you know, in English, techie? So the technologists can sit there and go, I want the technical bit. I want to see the bytes and the, the you know, the speeds and feeds and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. how big is it? And how does it fit in the rack? And, you know, do, how often do I need to update it? And what was the latest patch and all that kind of stuff? But the other one says, Mr. Exec, do this, and this is going to solve this problem. And solve this problem. This is a benefit. This is your problem. Here's in, your theory, in theory, they could use browsing history to make a personalized homepage depending on the kind of content you looked at before. Oh, wouldn't that be <laughs> wonderful? I mean, you know, the first time somebody talked to me about portals was probably 1997, and we still can't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there is that like GDPR thing and everything like you were talking about. <laughs> Might be yeah, a yeah. ways off from being able to do that, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but no. <laughs> um, well, awesome. Really interesting. So thank you so much for, for sharing your perspective. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, thanks everybody else for listening in. Uh, for more perspectives on the content marketing industry, check out thecontentmix.com. And we'll also be releasing more interviews like this one every weekday. So keep tuning into the podcast. See you next time.